I ask then, has God rejected his people? By no means. For I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Do you not know what the scripture says of Elijah, how he appeals to God against Israel? Lord, they have killed your prophets. They have demolished your altars, and I alone am left, and they seek my life. But what is God's reply to him? I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. So too, at the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. But if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace would no longer be grace. What then? Israel failed to obtain what it was seeking. The elect obtained it, but the rest were hardened. Verse 11. So I ask, did they stumble in order that they might fall? By no means. Rather, through their trespass, salvation has come to the Gentiles, so as to make Israel jealous. Now, if their trespass means riches for the world, and if their failure means riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their full inclusion mean? Verse 24. For if you were cut off from what is by nature a wild olive tree and grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these, the natural branches, be grafted back into their own olive tree? Lest you be wise in your own sight, I do not want you to be unaware of this mystery, brothers. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved, as it is written, the, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will banish ungodliness from Jacob. And this will be my covenant with them, will take away their sins. As regards the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. But as regards election, they are beloved for the sake of their forefathers. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. Verse 33. Oh, the depths of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counselor? Or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, good morning, Covenant. It's uh, good to be seen by you. <laughs> and I look forward to when I get to see you again. Hey, let me start by correcting a senior moment from last week. I gave you an email address that was wrong. For those who are perhaps uh, underemployed, unemployed, needing to uh, make use of our Church Mercy Fund, I gave you the uh, email address mercy at covenantpalmbay.org, and it is actually mercy help. I left out the word help at covenantpalmbay.org. Let me encourage you to use that or to point people that you know and maybe you're reaching out to in our community and let us as a church minister to them. On that same line, let me encourage those of you who perhaps um, you have not been affected financially uh, by this uh, crisis. Your employment is solid. You're receiving paychecks and things like that. You know, in a week or so, we're going to start getting uh, stimulus checks from the government. And I want to encourage those of us who uh, have jobs and have employment in our size to, it, to consider giving a, a good portion, a tithe or more, even all of that stimulus check to our mercy fund so that we can actually make sure that that money that the government is giving uh, maybe gets given to people who need it the most. And uh, so, you know, just a matter of conscience. And of course, some are going to lay aside maybe because we don't know what the future is uh, going to hold. But let me uh, encourage you to consider uh, at least giving some of that to help those that our church is helping in our community and in our church family. We're in the final study, uh, final chapter, <coughs> excuse me, of our study in Romans that zeroes in on God's sovereignty. We've been looking at different aspects of God's sovereignty, how he faithfully accomplishes the salvation of those whom he has sovereignly chosen, that God's sovereignty and salvation challenges uh, our fallen desires for self-lordship. And then last week, 
uh, we began to deal with that sticky issue of human responsibility and how God's sovereignty over everything does not eliminate human responsibility. Well, here in chapter 11, Paul uh, opens up and he's returning to questions and themes that he began in chapter 9, and he's going to complete his answers and his explanations for what was being asked in chapter 9. Essentially, being asked that if God is sovereign, how do we explain what has happened to the Israelites and to the nation of Israel? So this morning, it's Palm Sunday, and as uh, we look into Paul's answer to these questions, I hope to do at least some tie-in to this holy day in the Christian year. Now, for those of you who take notes and you like an outline, uh, we are going to come to this chapter and divide it into three sections. First, we're going to see a past rejection in verses 1 to 10, and then we will look at the current reality in verses 11 to 23, and then finally, a future restoration in the remaining verses of the chapter. So let's start with the, the beginning, a past rejection. Now we need to look back to chapters 9 and 10 because they set the stage for what Paul says at the beginning of chapter 11. If you think back to chapter 9, there were clearly some people who were questioning Paul as to, you know, is God really sovereign? And exhibit A in their questions and argumentation was, well, what about Israel? They're, they're not, they're God's chosen people, and they are not worshiping Jesus. They're not receiving Jesus. So how can you say God is sovereign in any way? And so Paul responds to this by by really explaining that our understanding of that expression, Israel, is flawed. We're, we're, we're too literal with that term, Israel. He says in Romans chapter 9, verses 6 to 8, but it is not as though the word of God has failed, for not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel, and not all are children of Abraham. And not all are children because they are his offspring, but through Isaac shall your offspring be named. This means that it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as offspring. So Paul's explanation is very simple. He says, just because someone is a physical descendant of Abraham, an ethnic Jew does not mean they are part of Israel. We, we, to help this, to kind of differentiate here, we use the expression true Israel. There's Israel, the nation, all the Jewish people around the world through history, and then there there is a subset, true Israel. And this is what Paul is getting at here in Romans chapter 9, verses 6 to 8. He says, hey, you, you don't understand what that word Israel actually is meaning and indicating from God's perspective. And along the same lines, we don't understand who God is and what his plan actually is for the, is the Jewish people. He says in Romans chapter 9, verse 22, what if God desiring to show his wrath and to make known his power, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction in order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy, which he has prepared beforehand for glory, even us whom he has called, not from the Jews only, but also from the Gentiles. And then, of course, last week we saw in chapter 10, that all of us, including the Israelites, we are responsible for our efforts at self-worship and self-lordship. He says at the end of chapter 10, but of Israel, God says, all day long, I have held out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. So with that in mind, it makes sense as to why Paul would pose the question he does in these opening verses of Romans chapter 11. He begins in verse 1, I ask then, has God rejected his people? And to this idea, Paul gives a resounding no. God forbid, this is never going to happen. By no means. For I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin, God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Do you not know what the scripture says of Elijah, how he appeals to God against Israel, to true Israel? 
to those whom God has foreknown before the foundations of the world, he has remained faithful. Paul brings back into his uh, statements and his arguments that great word from Romans chapter 8, verses 29 and 30, foreknew. And you can look back in those messages and see how important this word is. There have always been Jews, Jewish people, ethnic descendants of Abraham, who God took the initiative to redeem because he decided before creation to set his love upon them. And he's been faithful to every one of those individuals who he foreknew. Paul provides himself as an example of this in verse 1. He, he points to an Old Testament story of Elijah, the prophet that was, was preaching and proclaiming to the nation of Israel, the northern kingdom, during their time of severe rebellion and rejection of God and the faith of their fathers, and to that remnant that he mentions to Elijah. Elijah, you think you're all by yourself, but the reality is I have 7,000 others in that nation who I have redeemed, who I foreknew. So too, verse 5, at the present time, there is a remnant. Just as there was a remnant in Elijah's time, there is a remnant, he says, chosen by grace. And we've seen this through the centuries all the way down to our day, Currently, a small number of Jewish people who believe the gospel and they turn to Christ. But we, but we have to acknowledge that the nation, the, the people as a whole, the Jewish people around the world, by and large, they have rejected their Messiah. They've rejected the faith of their patriarchs. About today, if you look at the nation of Israel, two-thirds of the nation are secular or, at best, non-religious traditional people. So they have no God. They acknowledge no God. They worship no God. They've rejected Him. So Paul says in verse 7, What then? Israel failed to obtain what it was seeking. The elect obtained it, but the rest were hardened. As it is written, God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes that would not see and ears that would not hear down to this very day. I mean, think about the history of the Israelites and those people. God chose them to be his people. He chose them from all the nations of the world, not because they were mighty, not because they were morally superior, not because they were better than anyone else. He chose them simply because of his grace But we have to acknowledge that while they were called God's chosen people, not all of those who were called historically God's chosen people were chosen by God to be part of true Israel. You have this mass of people who were the chosen people of God. They were a nation that was to be a light to all the other nations, and yet God did not set upon them his sovereign grace to bring them to salvation. God does this. He chooses people. He chooses nation states to fulfill different roles in his his eternal plan. You see this in the Old Testament. You see God choosing Saul, for example, to be the first king of the Israelites. Yet, Saul rejected God. He was rebellious. We have no evidence that he was a redeemed man in any way. God chose the Assyrians, a nation that was cruel and violent, to bring about his retribution and his judgment to the northern kingdom. There's obviously they're fulfilling a role within God's plan, yet they were not redeemed. Look at Jesus and his apostles. There was one, Judas, chosen by God to fulfill a role within God's overall eternal plan, yet he was not redeemed. See, his choice to fulfill a role within his eternal plan does not automatically mean that one is chosen to be a part of true Israel and to experience salvation and redemption. So we have a past rejection by Israel as a whole towards God and his redemptive plan. They make a choice, and because of that choice, they are responsible for it. And they experience, as it says in verse 9, God's divine retribution. 
a hardening of their hearts, a dullness of the spiritual eyes and ears that has happened through the centuries and brings us to our generation. There's a past rejection that has drastically affected the physical descendants of Abraham. Now let's look at the, the present reality. Verse 11 says, so I ask, did they stumble in order that they might fall? By no means, rather through their trespass, salvation has come to the Gentiles so as to make Israel jealous. But if some of the branches were broken off and you, although a wild olive shoot were grafted in among the others and now share in the nourishing root of the olive tree, do not be arrogant <coughs> towards the branches. Note then the kindness and the severity of God. Severity towards those who have fallen, but God's kindness to you, provided you continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you too will be cut off. And even they, if they do not continue in their unbelief, will be grafted in. For God has the power to graft them in again. These verses, they give us great insight and they provide us with an overview of what God is actually doing. And it's a natural spot in our text to kind of tie it in to Palm Sunday and the importance of Palm Sunday and the Holy Week as it, it helps shape our understanding of this text. Let's start with what is it that God is doing here? Right? There's a lot of words, a lot of in, in illustrations and analogies in, in this section of Romans 11. What's he going to at? So just very simply, here it is. God is creating one people for himself, one true Israel. Let me repeat that. This is what God is doing. He's been doing ever since the beginning of time. Through all the covenants, God is creating one people for himself, one true Israel. And the, the illustration of the olive trees are important in helping communicate this truth, right? Think about it. <laughs> you have two olive trees. You have this cultivated olive tree that God is tending, and it represents the people of God. In the old covenant, it would have been that remnant of Jews who were faithful and who believed in God through the old covenant. Today, we see something else happening. There's a second tree over here, right? This wild olive tree, and it represents all the Gentile nations of the world, right? And what do you see? You see God who has broken off branches from this one tree, and he's taking branches from this wild tree, Gentile nations, he's breaking them off, and he's grafting them in. What, so what is this saying here? He's saying, listen, there are physical Jews, descendants of Abraham. They are not part of my true Israel. They are not part of the people of God that I am forming. I'm breaking them off. And by and large, this represents, at least today, the reality for most ethnic Jews around the world. They've rejected their Messiah. They are branches that have been broken off. And God is breaking branches from this other tree, all the Gentile nations, and he's creating and populating true Israel with all the people groups of the world, Gentiles, and we notice in this illustration, some Jews are being grafted in. But I want you to notice something very important. It is one tree. One Israel. There's not two and three trees. There's, there's not Israel the nation and the church and the Gentiles that God is working. There's just one tree that God is cultivating. One people. God's focus. Church, it's not on nation state building. God's focus, God, God has roles for nations. He had roles for the Assyrians, the Egyptians, the, the Babylonians, the Romans. He has had roles for the United States of America. He has a role for the nation of Israel. But his focus is not on nation states. It's on one people, true Israel. And we need to understand this because, you know, in our patriotism as Americans, it's very easy for us to wrap our faith in the flag. But we've got to understand that what Christ is and who he is and what God is doing, our flag is an insufficient symbol for this work of making true Israel. 
The symbol for what God is doing needs to be much greater because his work is so expansive. And that symbol is what brings us to Palm Sunday because this eternal building project, cultivation project that God is doing is only possible because of what Palm Sunday and this Holy Week points us to. The only symbol big enough to wrap this thing all up, the cross of Jesus Christ and that empty tomb. So the final takeaway truth for this series on God's sovereignty, it's appropriate for today because this symbol of the cross is so important in this cultivation of true Israel. Through the agony of the cross, Jesus purchased every one of those branches that are being grafted into this tree. Through the agony of the cross, Jesus purchased our redemption. Whether you're Gentile and Jew or Jew, being grafted into God's people, Jesus purchased our redemption, and he purchased a people for himself. You know, as we consider Palm Sunday, I've always been moved by the Luke account of, of what happened on that day, because it reveals to us and shows us the heart that Jesus had for the Jewish people, his fellow brothers and sisters. He's like Paul. And we pick this up in Paul in these chapters, the deep emotion, the deep heartbreak over the rejection of the ethnic descendants of Abraham to the Messiah. In in the beginning, in Luke chapter 19, as Jesus, before Jesus enters the city on that Palm Sunday with all the acclaim that comes with it, we read this little incident. When he drew near and he saw the city, he wept over it, saying, Would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. Israel, then and now, tragically is blind to who Jesus is. On that day when he rode into Jerusalem and the, and the throngs, the crowds of people lined the road and they, they waved palm branches and they put them before him, they were looking at him as this deliverer from the Roman oppression. <clears throat> they didn't realize that more importantly, Jesus is the fulfillment of the law and the prophets and the promises of God. As Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, for all of God's promises have been fulfilled in Christ with a resounding yes. Jesus is this fulfillment. And one of those promises that Jesus fulfills ties right back into the language of Romans chapter 11, that language of a remnant. You know, in the, the, the language of remnant, as we saw here in, in verses three, verse 3, it goes back to the Old Testament, the Old Covenant. Elijah and the remnant that God reminds him of. The prophets use this promise of a remnant that would worship God and would serve God faithfully. Jeremiah brings it up. Isaiah, for example, in chapter 10, gives us one of the most clear examples of it. A remnant will return, the remnant of Jacob to the mighty God. For though your people Israel be as the sand of the sea, only a remnant of them will return. Destruction is decreed, overflowing with righteousness, for the Lord God of hosts will make a full end as decreed in the midst of all the earth. And and what's going on here is that the Israelites, because of their rejection of God and the faith of the patriarchs and of Moses and the old covenant, they go into captivity. They're conquered by nations used by God to bring about his retribution. Ultimately, the southern kingdom, the tribe of Judah, those Hebrews are taken by the Babylonians and later the Persians for 70 years. They're in captivity. And the promise here is that after the exile, a remnant will return and rise up and serve God. And sure enough, God brought about Cyrus and a remnant does return. And and you can read Nehemiah and Ezra and that story in the Old Testament. But here's the thing. This remnant never, ever fulfilled the promises and the prophecies given with, by the prophets. They were not faithful. They, they did not worship God with true heart. They intermarried, and there were all kinds of issues. And, and Israel entered into another very dark period of time. They didn't learn the lessons of their forefathers at all. 
So as a result, you come to the end of the Old Testament and a period of silence where God just doesn't even speak to them. During that intertestamental period, the Maccabees, they weren't the remnant. Uh, the, the Jews of Jesus' day, they certainly weren't the remnant. The Jews of Paul's day, they were not the remnant. Who's the remnant? Well, if you keep reading in Isaiah, in chapter 11, Isaiah tells us, God tells us, there shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. Jesse, father of David, King David, and the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. So a descendant of David will be this remnant. His delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide disputes by what his ears hear, but with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. And then he goes on and talks about how the, the lamb will lay down with the leopard, and the child will play with the lion in this day to come when this remnant, this person, rules over all the earth. So they shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountains, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. The true Israel, the true remnant is Jesus Christ. And it's everyone who has been united to Christ through faith. The bad news of the gospel is that in our natural state, we will reject God, we will reject Jesus Christ just as surely as the Israelites did. But the good news of the gospel is that through Jesus, we have been grafted back into the tree of true faith, of true Israel, and we've become inheritors through Christ of all the promises of God that he's made to his people. God is sovereign over his redemptive plan. He is forming one people into true Israel. And 1 Peter chapter 1 tells us that God's sovereignty is so absolute that even before the foundations of the world, he says in verse 20, that he decrees that Christ will die for our sins. In Ephesians chapter 1, he says that his sovereignty is so absolute that he chooses before the world was ever created those who he will redeem, who will bring into his family, who he will be made holy and to servants and priests of God. But the good news, it doesn't end with us Gentiles. The good news includes ethnic Jews. God remembers his promises that he's made to Abraham. And he has a plan to restore the physical descendants of Abraham to true Israel. Remember the illustration. The branches can be grafted back in again. And the expectation is that this is going to happen. And so he says in verse 25, lest you be wise in your own sight, I want you to understand this mystery, brothers. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness, until. So there's an ending for this hardness until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved. This doesn't mean every single Jew who lives, but this is an expression meaning the people as a whole. There's coming a time when the people as a whole, they will believe in Jesus and be saved. As it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will banish ungodliness from Jacob. And this will be my covenant with them that I take away their sins as regards the gospel, they are enemies of God for your sake. That's the reality right now. But as regards election, they are beloved for the sake of their forefathers, for the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. There's coming a day when God will pour out his grace upon the Jewish people. <laughs> 
They, like the Gentiles, what we see happening in the nations around today will have around the earth today, will have their hearts changed and they will turn to Jesus. They will believe in him. And if I understand scripture correctly, I believe there's going to be a great multitude of Jews from around the world who experience this redemption. And therefore, we should pray, we should work for this future time of restoration for the Jewish people to be brought into God's kingdom. And we can do this knowing that it is going to happen. Jesus will make all things new, including the hearts of Jewish people around the world. So that one day that, that cultivated olive tree will be populated with all kinds of branches from all the nations of this world, Gentiles from all around, and there will be branches, many branches, from the physical descendants of Abraham. We're given a vision of this in Revelation chapter 7, and again, you see the imagery of Palm Sunday in this vision. In chapter 6 of Revelation, Jesus comes back. There's a vision of Jesus' return. And it's a horrendous vision. It's a, it's a day of terror. It's a day of judgment. It's a day when those who have rejected Jesus Christ experience the judgment of God upon their sins. And then in chapter 7, we're given a different picture. On the heels of that time of God pouring out his judgment upon those who reject Christ, you see then the gathering of true Israel in Revelation chapter 7, verse 3, saying, Do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees until we have sealed the servants of our God on their forehead. And I heard the number of the sealed, 144,000 sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel. And the verses go on to talk about 12,000 from this tribe and 12,000 from that tribe. And, and understand the point here isn't that there's going to be a measly 144,000 Jewish people who make up the kingdom of God at the end. No, that's, that's minuscule. This number is a, in, in Rome, in, in, excuse me, in Jewish, you know, uh, literature and the way Jews would think about numbers, this number is significant. It's a, it's a perfect number and it represents a massive number of people, 12,000 times 12, all the tribes of Israel. There will be this massive number of Israelites who are sealed by God and brought into the kingdom. And then as you continue to read, you see this. After this, I look and behold a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with what? Palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing before the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and they worshiped God saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. 2,000 years ago, people held palm branches and they streamed Hosanna before God, but their exclamations of praise were false for the majority of them. They weren't receiving him as Messiah. But there is coming a day when the greatest, most ultimate manifestation of Palm Sunday will occur. And people from all through the ages, from all the people groups, that final creation, that true Israel, that cultivated olive tree, we will come before our Lord, we will become before our God, and we will exclaim how his sovereignty is absolute and it's seen. And the beautiful faces, of different colors and ethnicities of his eternal family. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this picture you give us. But here on this Palm Sunday, we look forward to the day when you make all things new and we come before you and we worship you as the true King, the Lord over all.
But Lord Jesus, thank you for making that future day possible through what this holy week represents, and what it signifies. None of it was possible, would be possible if you had not ridden into that city on that day, that Palm Sunday, two, almost 2,000 years ago, and begun Holy Week that would culminate in your cruel and your unjust execution. The story doesn't end there. It ends next Sunday with you defeating death, rising from the dead, providing for us our redemption, a redemption that comes through faith in you by grace, the grace of our Heavenly Father. To his praise, to your glory, Lord Jesus, we thank you and pray. Amen.